can hear the microphone. Okay, okay So I'm Laurie Farrell. I am the chairperson or the chairman of the wood carving subgroup. Um, I've only been doing this for about a year or so. So I'm always interested in getting input, feedback, recommendations from anybody who wants to have a demonstration or any types of classes. So please contact me if you have any ideas or recommendations for future meetings. Um, today we've got Dan, who has happily volunteered to help us to, with the carving subgroup and doing a demonstration on his um, table that he built. And he got it put in American Period Furniture. Is it this month's edition? It's this year's this edition, year's yeah. Edition. It's a once okay. a year, yeah. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Thanks, Laura. All right. Uh, what I thought I would do, and I thought with the demonstration, is I had this uh, entry entry chest project that I did, and I'll pass some pictures around. Um, what, what I wanted to do with the talk was talk more about the design of the carving and how, how that kind of drove the piece, talk about making patterns and some of the things I thought about for building the piece, and we'll do some carving too. It's what I thought I would do for the whole thing. So, so um, basically I took the Bombay serpentine chest of drawer idea. So this, this is a Bombay on the side, Bombay in the front and serpentine in the front as well. Uh, what, they, what they had said, they liked the Bombay shape. That was kind of a parameter and needed to be under five feet or around five feet long. Um, and they wanted carving. That was the parameters of the project. So what I wanted to start with is I wanted to start with the carving. So I got the idea of having the Bombay shape. I took the commode theme and kind of lifted it up on the legs. Um, and what I started with is I just you know, sat down on the drawing board and I started drawing uh, uh, the carving mainly. So I had, I, I had an idea. So it started with this actually. So after going back and forth and, and uh, whatnot, I basically sent them a proposal, depending on what the budget was gonna be and some different ideas, but there's two halves to that drawing that you can see. It's got a couple of different carving themes and we obviously went with the one on the left-hand side and I started doing some proportioning and trying to figure that stuff out. And we ended up with a sketch, which is basically was the theme of this whole thing. And that sketch, is kind of what sold the concept to them um, as far as the size and the design and what we were thinking about doing. Um, I guess that was around too. And that, that led to this part here. So basically I was trying to flush this out and figure it out. I'm trying to just, um, whenever you design a piece, you need to design within the material you're gonna use, right? You, uh, so um, here I'm gonna try to design it within the stock that I was gonna use. It wasn't gonna go larger than 16 quarter. Uh, for the legs, so I basically started with the 16 quarter blank. And uh, my main thought was I was gonna draw out the leg to what I thought I liked for the shape. So basically, uh, I started with the leg and I wanted to have an apron in here. So I started with the carving. So normally with a lot of the work I do, a lot of traditional work that I do, um, it has a theme to it, it already has kind of a design to it. Yep. So from this, I started to develop my drawing, my plans, right? Uh, uh, my building plans and I don't I don't tend to make a lot of prototype you know work for this kind of stuff I just kind of go ahead and I start doing my build but because of the shape of this I was trying to keep the build as as basic as possible because I wanted to put the time here right this is where the investment was uh, for the budget of the piece was was in what it looked like but I wanted to do a traditional build so there's no plywood in here or anything like that it's a traditional build um, you have wood that's say 50, 60 years old. Yeah. Wood that's five, eight years old, mm -hmm. kill dry. Do you find that there's any difference in the difficulty of carving between the two where they're basically around the same? They're basically about the same. Like I said, um, uh, uh, this stuff was funny. Whoever had it, when they cut it up, they waxed all the ends. Everything was waxed and preserved. Do you think it was the end dry? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. I mean, it could have been, but but uh, probably not. It didn't carve that much easier than than uh, dried mahogany, like Mike was saying. So when I started doing my drawing, I was trying to figure it out, and I said, okay, I have, I have my lengths, I have my heights, I have uh, my rough leg shape for what I wanted to do. But also, when I started doing the shaping, um, I got everything so it was going to be flush, but I knew the carving was going to be there. What I was trying to figure out too is when the carving goes in, like the flower that ends up inside of this area here that gets carved. All of this wood is here, right? When you saw that out before you shape it away. So that flower has the material that's actually there. It's probably down there somewhere. Um, ends up having about a half an inch, maybe three eighths to a half an inch worth of wood that 
needs to go away to make the shaping there. So all you're going to do when you start carving this out and you start relieving the background, it actually gives you the wood and the shape actually helps it. So rather than just being a flat board and trying to make a flower look like it has a lot of movement to it, you're getting the movement from this shape. You're getting this curve and you're getting the serpentine shape that way too. So if you want to look at some of the carving, that's the carving on the chest. But basically, like I said, I started with this. Uh, I didn't deviate too far off of, off of this. I refined the patterns a little bit um, uh, when I did the carving. But my, what, uh, what was important to me is I didn't want to have any flats left on it other than the, uh, the flat of the top. Um, I wanted to get everything to flow. So the idea was, and, and again, this, this, this isn't exactly how it ended up. It was just me trying to figure it out. But I was trying to get kind of like the snail's foot to happen down below. Uh, um, I wanted kind of a, a volute foot. Um, I ended up doing the volutes at the top. I was going to do some leafage up there, but it was underneath the top, and I was trying to put, put the time and energy in the front uh, facade. So basically, I had these little volutes that happened at the end, and I wanted the leaf coming out of the foot, and then I wanted the leaves to start coming up from the sides. Right, so the leaves come up the sides, and, and here on the side they just end. I think it comes up maybe a little bit further, but they end, and there's no carving on the side. It's just the shape of the, of the side. But when it comes around the front, uh, it's not carved on this one, but it would do the same thing. You have the foot and the leaf coming up, and then this leaf comes up, and then that's what's transferring over. Right? So there's leaves that come up the leg. There's a couple of flips in there, and that's what transfers over into the rail. Right. So I wanted this thing to look like it was growing across, and then it comes up and ends in a volute top and bottom. Um, so that that's kind of what what uh, drove everything. So this, so from the sketch, right, the basic sketch to this, uh, this is what drove the design of the piece, and, and uh, it was kind of set by its overall size. We kind of divided that up in the beginning, no bigger than five feet. Um, my thought process on some of this stuff and designing that was having the leaves kind of flow up and look like they were growing across the rail and have some termination. What happens in between, like traditionally, there's a lot of uh, chip nail carvings, mirrors, and different things of the, uh, like that that have this kind of filigree, like a filler almost, like, you know. Um, so it's something, it does have a lot of detail at the tip, but the actual carving work is not that, that much. It's, very, um, it's not shaped a lot, it just has a little scoop that goes down. All the work is in the set-in work at the top, but this, this part um, is relatively quick. So just, just time comparison for me, um, for me to do like all of that filigree work there and there, takes me about as long to do, you know, that as it maybe does to do like one flower. Hmm. So it offsets. This, this whole rail took about two weeks for me to do, all the way from, um, uh, from rough out at that point to, to uh, fully carved, but again, that the patterns are the same, but the flowers are different. I, you know, uh, um, I purposely carve each one slightly different. So the roses actually tip a little different. Uh, 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 the small flowers, how they overlap, you know, it's got three over here and they're kind of reversed on the other side. They might have a different flip to the leaf or something like that. So I try to keep them kind of symmetrical pattern wise, but independent. Uh, except for the filigree, uh, but even that, even that uh, kind of changes side to side. So probably the primary thing that is is perfectly symmetrical is that kind of center cartouche because your eye will see it. So I, want, so I made each flip the same, and all of the all all the background diapering is all the same, and then it changes, like I said, from here over. It's slightly different on both sides, but. Once I got to a point that the construction actually went pretty quickly, and that was the whole point, was to try to get it built as quick as I could so I could spend the time here and on the front apron. And I carved the legs uh, first. I did all of the carving at the feet and across the legs. And I basically, I carved this whole leg on this side all the way through. And on the front, I would carve up to about here because I didn't know how, how this rail and, and the leg were going to blend together at that point until I started doing the carving. So basically, I carved the front rail up to about that point as well. Point. Um, and then basically once, once that work and that work was done, I um, had glued the whole front facade. So my last carving was the whole front facade with the legs on there and the rail on there so I could finish up here. Yeah. But now I had to develop the patterns, right? So I had, I had this, but now I had a reality to it. And when, it, uh, when I came to the mock-up, I wanted to try to figure out, you know, 
how do I do this? How do I carve this leg? How do I do this shape? Can't just leave to it. There's a process, there's an order to that, right? So I wanted this to have the same thing. So how do I do this? How do I do the repetition? All four legs had carving on it. They all had the same thing all the way around. Um, so uh, what I was able to do here is figure out, I was like, okay, on the roughing out of this blank, this big 16 quarter blank, but nothing is left flat. So what I did is I tried to break down the process. Where can I take primary chamfers? I could actually take a draw knife and I could take a lot of that corner off and, and, and chamfer that big corner off to find kind of the nose of the snail's foot. Um, I could chamfer off the back and figure that stuff out, but when I chamfered that off, I didn't want to chamfer off the sides, right? It's not like a cabriole leg where it's the same all the way around. You gotta leave this wood in the corners for the leaves to be able to project out. And I wanted to be able to easily carve a trough on here that had a consistent width to it. But as the leg shape goes up and gets wider, even though this trough and this trough are the same as each other when they're running up the side, as they get broader up here, it makes that one uh, uh, flare out Done. And I think I did all of the top volutes and kind of the snail's head at the top. And then I went down the foot and I kind of roughed in uh, the foot around the side and, and did the volutes on the sides. Um, and then I was able to come in and lay out my patterns and do my patterns for my uh, acanthus leaves here. And then um, I was able to carve the side ones all the way through, right? That could be finished off. I left a little bit of material here so I could get this to blend in and this to blend in. And then the front patterns as well. I had two individual patterns. So this was my side pattern right, that got laid right on there that I could uh, lay that on and trace that on. In front one, same thing. I think I based it off of the top of the, of the leaf that comes out of the foot. And that laid up in the inside of the blank is the reference for that. So it shows you the leaves and how they flip and how they come up and through. Um, and again, um, I went from something that I just kind of drew and sketched and I had to come up with something that I could actually put tools to. So I made sure the tools were gonna fit the shapes that I liked to make it practical and make it repeatable. So this pattern, I just punched it out at a poster board so this could be used on all the sides for symmetry. Um, and then the same thing with the, with, the, with, uh, with the top and the bottom. Top and the bottom volutes are there and there from the side and that's the foot you know, volute that gets laid on the side of the pattern when you chamfer that out. Yeah, trying to keep the symmetry of it, like I said, is, is uh, I think a lot of it just, just comes from, from the process, right? If you're repeating the process all the way through, even if you're eyeing it, it's gonna be fairly consistent. Wow. So basically what I did is I traced it um, again and kind of came through and on, on the longer shapes, the ones that were gonna be at the bottom, I just did that with a pair of scissors, but all of the independent leaves of this will come out of there will come out of there. And, and so you didn't note what gouges you used to cut those with? No, because again, uh, each, each one that happens in here, like I said, I do this whole thing at once, so once I made that pattern, I actually did that carving. Oh. And then I did the next pattern and make oh. the carving, so. So, so what would you do if you had to do another one now? <laughs> I would jump for joy and charge more. <laughs> right. uh, but each one of these, like I said, each one of these are gonna punch through. So this goes all the way across. So I made independent patterns because I treated each one as an individual unit, but also they had to lay across the curves. Right? Compound curves, you couldn't just lay the one sheet across so they don't lay flat on there so I could trace them. Um, but again, so these are all, the, each flower has an independent one on here. So this guy is here, this guy is here, this one is here. And again, where the flowers are, I still try to have some leaf flips in there and things like that that would pick up from the leg, the theme of the legs, and then that one goes right there. All right, so each one has the individual flair to it. Um, I came through and I had sawn out the serpentine shape first, all right? So I sawed out this shape of that rail first. I went down and see how much material comes away on there. But it also was gonna get the Bombay shape in, in, in that, that theme as well. So when you look at this little cutoff, this was just another cutoff. So what I basically did, right, if I, tra I traced that, that uh, shape on here yesterday and I left that material. So basically that gets sawn out 
that amount of wood goes away. You see on the end there, that was the shape it was going to get. That's the Bombay shape of the rail to the leg. And that happens in the middle as well. And what was interesting is you get this. Uh, so the drawers come down and they swell at the apron and they come under. So it looks like it has a lot of uh, shape to it here. That, that shape happens all the way across. But as you cut this away, it, look, it looks flatter. And it picks up the Bombay shape again just because of the width of the rail. As that varies, it changes the shape of what it looks like. So what happens is I left the end shape alone. I left this one pretty flat here, right? Because I was going to carve that out. But in the middle of this whole thing, it got shaped. Right? So all of this, all this shaping work was kind of roughed in. But what I did is I wanted to have, so the drawers are flush to the dividers and they're flush to the top of the apron. And they lo it looks like that the, uh, the drawers flow right into the apron, right? Everything is flush as it comes down and the carving just sits above it. But I wanted to be able to do kind of the shaping of the drawers and working on everything at the same time. So the very first thing I did is I sought out the serpentine shape and I had shaped the rail some in the middle and all that and left the end flat. And then I took that rail before I cut anything out in the rail and basically I cut a rabbit in there or carved a rabbit, right? Because it's, cause it's a, con a, a compound curve so you can't really run it on the router very well. So the first thing I did is I carved that rabbit. All right, let me just do that really quick. And what that did is I worked to the pattern and I could use the v tool. which end. I'm going to do that end more anyways. I won't, I won't do the whole thing here. But. So I used the V tool to kind of create a line and it didn't have to be straight or perfect because everything else, the carving, think about this, the carving is going to end up down here, right? So like this material, you looked at this. Right, so this is what's going to be left here. All of this material is going to have to go away. That's all ground to that. So take, do these guys. And I basically work down to a rough depth and work down to that shape line. Like I said, it left me, I don't know if it was a half an inch, but it might have been three eighths of an inch or something, I forget. Yeah, the the reference line was the Bombay shape on the side. Well, you run that across the, the top of the board. But uh, yeah, okay. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, basically just keep. I'm not going to do the other half here. We're getting there. So the reason you make a rabbit is to establish the curve. Exactly. And leaves the stuff that's going to become the relief. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so that's telling me the material I have to relieve for the carving, how much wood I have for that shaping, but it allows me to keep moving forward with the drawers. So at this point, my drawers are, you know, shaped, right? Rough shape. This is shaped. <clears throat> uh, these are rough shaped. So once I do this, I scribe, you know, that material, and this is where the that drawer this, this uh, second drawer comes across flush from the divider to that point, I know where that is in, in the space of everything. Getting close here. Anyways, you did, and at the end, it wouldn't be right on the money because I want to be able to blend that at the end. Is there is this drawer, there's a drawer that goes into that? No, this is, this is the front of the drawer. So when you're... Ah. So when this is done, right, that's in there like that, this drawer front hits that point flush. 
you know, or however that would have been. I don't have a piece that'll fit it, but so you know what I mean. It was traced from the draw. Yeah. yeah. It's basically right from at the that draw, point. From the pattern, from your pattern. Well, right? from the pattern gets it close, but eventually the drawer and the dividers are going to be in the same plane. Yeah. And, you're all and you work down. them once they were together, did you and the, work on them? Work, yeah, once, once this was established, and once the drawers were, like I independently scribed the drawers from, from the dividers, got them shaped pretty close. Once it was glued up and I fit the drawer fronts in there snug, I fared everything at, at once. So everything was the same uh, shape. But that, that's basically, I had cut that rabbit. Once that rabbit was cut, then, then I cut out the bottom profile. So you see how much material comes away and how much is actually left you know, with, with these things. There's a little bit more thickness in here, but not a ton. But um, so what I did is this, my primary pattern, I went back to this and used this because this was just one solid uh, piece of poster board. Then I cut that out. This was my roughing out pattern because all of this material is going to be grounded, right? So what I could do is I could lay this on my blank and I could just trace these rough uh, lines around there that I could V-tool out. I could V-tool and start grounding out the background, get everything to look like it flows in. So that'll be the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start grounding out that background a little bit. We'll trace All right, so we're at that point. All right, we got this big rail. This rail's 46 inches long with its tenons. It's longer, about 40, a little over, I think they were 49 or something like that. And we're gonna trace, and then I traced that bottom on that got cut out there. And then I was able to trace this on here. Right, so I just, I got somewhat close, but wanted to leave myself some room to be able to get in a little closer after the fact. And I think I'm gonna take that down just a little bit further first. Like I said, just come in with the V-tool. And I know, all right, so I know all this material is here to car. I know that it's, everything can go down to that rabbit, but I'm also, I'm not just gonna take that flat across. I'm imagining, I'm thinking about that Bombay shape, all right? So the drawer's coming up, hits that rabbit that's roughly at that Bombay shape. This is actually gonna come up and it's gonna get a little shallower inside of here. So. You do that by I did it by eye, yeah. One other thing to think about when you're if you're trying to be consistent about uh, carving, grinding out a background, if you're using a gouge, right, gouge is just a, just a circle. If you, get, if you make your gouge cuts the same width, right, all the way across, they're all the same depth, right? So you can systematically go across something, make a bunch of gouge cuts, and you know every one is the same depth, if they're the same width as each other. So a lot of times I'll go through and I'll make my first cuts like that, and I'll have some space between them. But I know, you know, that, that, and that are the, all the same depth. Then I can take the bridges out in between. All right, so I try not to be too willy-nilly about it. I just so I try to be somewhat systematic in my, in my process to get started. But again, this is going to be a little shallower here eventually. But I'm just kind of wasting this stuff away as efficiently as possible. All right, something like this, I could use a bigger gouge, too. I've got bigger eights and nines in there, too. But... I use the mallet a lot more now than I than I used to. Uh, 
uh, when I was younger, I just would bowl through it. Now I use the mallet a lot. You have a lot more control. Your mallet's gotten bigger. They're gotten heavier. <laughs> yeah. You're heavier. I don't have to. All right, so I'm running off that ramp that I've already established. That's my angle, right? The original kind of rabbit that we ran there. And I go a little flatter. Again, I do as much of this cross grain as I can because then I don't have to worry too much about grain direction at this point. Close. Right, so even if the thing is dead flat, which this isn't, uh, I don't use a flat tool. I, you know, I, I don't use a chisel or anything like that. I usually go down to a number, you know, three or a number two. I use the number twos a lot for grounding. It's a pretty flat surface, a flat enough looking surface for this. Okay. Just stop there, you can see where we are. All right, so there's a ton of stock removal, right? That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest part of the carving, right? Is, is getting it out of there. And again, you're trying to make it look like the, 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 the carving lays on top of the surface the best that you can. So I like, what I actually use a lot is that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you like that better than the breast? Yeah, I actually like the angle of the head of that. I actually, when they come, they come with a longer handle. That, that's the um, uh, Shenandoah Toolworks. Come with a long handle like that. I actually knocked it out, shortened it. Because uh, a lot of times I just hold it in my palm. Yeah, we'll control it. Watch yeah, right? yes. So I palm it a lot. What I like about the weight is I don't have to hit it very hard. I can just, I can just go along and just, just tap along. And, and again, I'm right hand dominant, so I can do a lot with my right hand. I can carve uh, 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 left handed pretty well, but I don't mallet left handed very well. I'm like, you know, I'm like this. But when I choke up on it, I can have more control right, just by tapping it. So. But um, I like that a lot. I've been using, uh, I've been trying to use this one quite a bit because I actually like the weight of that too. Uh, some people saw that one too, but that was one I got to try out. So I think about this is that if you take a tool that's at 25 degrees, right, you buy a brand new tool, it's 25 degrees or so. Um, depending on the height of your work, you think about the height of things. Um, my general consensus on that, like what I tell people, is the carving itself, what you're actually carving, doesn't want to be higher than when your arm's parallel to the floor. So this is as high as it should be. Usually, uh, usually something a little bit more or less. So this would be nice if it was probably about at my hand. If it was another two or three inches higher, it would be better on my back. But I think about that too, because I don't want to be over here a lot, is that when the carving angle's high, let's say you're 25 or 30 degrees, it's a good strong edge and if you mallet a lot. But if you hand carve, your, uh, your wrist is actually king. Think about hand planing. When you hand plane something, right, the hand plane totes down and your arm is straight and you have all that power and strength. A lot of carving, you're pushing with your body too. So same thing, when you do this, you, uh, it's hard on that kink. When you lower that angle down, it helps that. If you're at the right carving height, you actually straighten this out. But when that angle comes lower, if that ends up being 
20 or 15, it makes the edge weak. So you need an inside bevel to make it a little bit stronger. So some of my tools I have that way, some of them, uh, like this one here probably cuts down, it's cutting about there, whatever that is, you know, 20 degrees. But the angle, I don't care about the angle, I go for what it feels like. And then it, it, um, it has an inside bevel that compensates for that. So if it's cutting, let's say it's cutting at 20, then it's got, you know, it's got probably a five degree inside bevel. Some of the bigger tools I have, um, the inside bevel can be helpful because I think it helps kind of keep it down in the wood a little bit more. So this, this, is, this, uh, this is a 718, so, uh, so it actually has a pretty low angle to it, right? Uh, for comfort, for mallet, it's good for malleting, it's good for, for this, but the inside bevel is pretty strong on this. It's one to make it stronger, I use it for roughing out a lot, but also that, that, uh, uh, that inside bevel, I think, helps it keep it down in the wood. Um, it actually forces it down in there, but also it is, uh, good and strong. Uh, well, sharpening is uh, something that you want to keep on top of too. I mean, make sharpening sharpening as easy as possible to do, and as convenient as possible. You're more likely to do it. <laughs> so I have a setup. I use I use different things. Um, I use the Tormac a lot for the grinding. It makes the grinding really easy. Mm -hmm. I actually use it more for the buffer while I'm carving. Mm. When I sharpen something all the way through, I use my, my uh, grind it, get the bevel nice and, and whatnot. Then I use my slip stones and I sharpen it up. And then I don't buff anything. I just strop it a couple of times. And then I'll strop it, you know, uh, one or two times with a loose piece of leather as I'm working. But as you're working, to actually stop and, and re, re hone takes a little bit longer getting everything out. The Tormac was nice for that, that the buffing wheel allows you three or four buffings before it rounds you over uh, uh, the edge too much that mm -hmm. it doesn't want to sharpen up the right way. But man, it gets it back up and running really quickly and really nicely. Get to me. I'll do a little bit of this and then, and then we can take a, a, a restroom coffee break here. Right, so mainly I'm just thinking about all my elevations. So I need elevations here for these bottom leaves. And again, the depth of these is really, how much room do you, are you deciding to leave for, for the leaves? How much is that, is that filigree gonna ramp down there? What are you trying to get? How much rounding are you doing underneath here? Always connected to the wood with some part of your hand or your body. Right. Kind of blend out these. A lot of times these, 
you know, different leaves or, or on the bottom of an uh, uh, bottom on the bottom of an apron. A lot of times there's volutes in here and different things. Usually they're concave towards the outside edge and kind of convex on the inside edge. The concave gives you uh, some room to get the other leaf or the other volute to be proud, right? So just just how those shapes relate to each other. Again, most of the time, what was nice about this, even with all the carving, because of the shapes, there's kind of really, it's downhill, it's down, it's pretty obvious kind of the grand direction of what's going on with some of these things. But again, you're going to have some points, this is a transition point, which way is it going to want to go? I think I'm going to take this one a little deeper, just a little. And again, I wouldn't carve too far into this one because that's what's going to come off the leg, right, eventually. But we'll do a little bit here just to give it a little something. Let's go a touch deeper here. a little leaf that happens on the other side of this one too. When you're setting in these kind of side leaves, if you if you look at a Kansas leaves, a lot of the times they're not they're not really sharp points. They're not long sharp points unless they're with the grain, right? Think about if if if, if you have a leaf tip that goes with the grain, like that, it's a lot stronger than it is if you have a leaf tip that's kind of more across the grain, right? Because you have all of that short grain issue. So usually when they get to be like this, they're gonna be a, a stronger angle. So I think about like when this comes across here, that leaf that comes in, it's not 90 degrees, but it's pretty it's pretty square to the outside of the curve. Because if you get to be too, too pointy with it, it looks nice, but they're really, really fragile and they can break off uh, you know, uh, while you're carving, but also after they're, after it's been carved. Get a call from the customer. Yeah. <laughs> no callbacks. We don't want callbacks. Usually you know it right away. Oh yeah. <laughs> it breaks off and it's an oh shit moment. Yep. It's a it's a redesign, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. But also the bottom of this thing too, I didn't want to get crazy carving underneath there because it's underneath the rail. They don't want it to be too far. So after I kind of got this leaf going. What I did at the end, once this is all carved before it got glued up, I actually put it up on edge like that. And I took a veiner. Can't remember which one I used, but I took a veiner and I basically ran a trough. So 
So it actually gave me something that would break it up so I could carve up to a certain point. Not have to worry about it too much underneath. Like that, and I would blend it out. I blend it so I could clean up all the bandsaw marks. All right, I didn't, I didn't ferret. I left a lot of tool marks under there, so if somebody felt under, they could feel the, the shapes. I'd kind of chamfer off the inside, lightened it. Obviously, this is very rough, but you get the gist. Just finish up here. It's funny. I didn't. It wasn't that long that I that I actually had done this piece. The uh, customers picked it up at the beginning of September, and I was getting ready for this yesterday. And I was like, "How did I do that again? I couldn't. I can't got to remember. I don't remember dimensions. I don't. Because you did so many things in the out of sight, out of mind, right? Let's do. I'm going to put this leaf down maybe a little further, just to give it a little. And there wasn't no, you know, I don't, I didn't do any real highlights down on these that I think. I could always look at my pattern and see what it did. Oops. Don't do that. That's what we were just talking about. Design opportunity. Of course I did that because I was trying to be bold. Concerned about breakout? Nope. No, usually I take my time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually a lot more careful than this, but so I'm gonna nibble myself in a little closer first. Just using a bigger Vayner just to kind of do a, a rough set in so I can pop these guys out. This is where you designed it around the tools so that those curves would fit the tools themselves, yeah. And again with this filigree stuff I didn't didn't worry about hitting the pattern exactly. I would get in there and I would I would draw it in there. Then I'd just fit the tools the best that they did and just made the shapes as nice as I could. So there's a little bit of improv. Definitely some yeah. improv, yeah. Yeah, the pattern really was just a, just a base. Hmm? It's a point of departure. That's right. <laughs> yeah. much of this work cross grain as you can just for control and non-grain direction. Again, just trying to get as close as we can within reason.
All right, so again, this is always referencing off of that original grounding. That's kind of the important part of everything. somewhat close. Trying to see my pattern line here. So I'm gonna come right in down between the flower and that kind of fringe work. All right, this is the time consuming part is when you're getting in, in between all of these small elements up in here and doing the grounding work. Like I said, that was the probably the most time consuming part. Just all the background work. Here I'm trying to trying to judge the depth, right? I'm imagining this coming up. I'm looking at that shape on the side. How much room do I have? A little bit of filigree work. Let me do it up inside of here first, I guess. So when I had a single tool in my hand, I just try to find as many times as I could use that coming along. Obviously, I had a lot more of this to go, so I could just kind of mark, march on down through a lot of these things. are kind of the connectors between the two. And this is where things get fragile because you're popping these chips out of here. So I'm trying to relieve those from the side. I'm probably going to have to come back through and do a couple of little settings. I'm trying to do as many of these as I can before uh, picking those set-in tools. Again. I missed one of my settings right here. You're undercutting now? With that. Not, not undercutting yet. I'm just... just uh, square to the the curved surface, right? Because uh, once all this set-in work is done, then uh, that shape that comes up, I take it in and uh, round that edge over a little bit. So this this was left square, it wasn't undercut because of the, there's a ton of short grain in these little tips. Get these down as close as we can. I won't do too much of this because this is going to be boring and time consuming. But again, just trying to be careful the best we can. thing you can do with this kind of stuff is pry. Oh yeah. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> 
I still got a window to run. <laughs> Brian? Yeah. Cry you cry. Cry you cry. Just another opportunity to refine the design. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to do that too much. <laughs> then it doesn't look like the design anymore. <clears throat> you can see how we're getting down in there. Some of these longer ones. You know, when I was doing this, I definitely had a rhythm of, of the right tools for the task that we were doing. And trying not to leave any stab marks down in the in the base. I didn't want to see a lot of tool marks left in the base there. You know? Try to get that as clean as I could. My fishtails are really nice for this because they're nice and thin. The profiles are thin. Dan, do you teach a course in patience and coffee? Because <laughs> I can't imagine doing all this stuff. This one is yeah. crying, too. <laughs> You're back with it's the same parts, isn't it? My brain would not be like, well, you could have this in about five years. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you know, if it's kind of say, you gotta love, love the work, you know. Yes. I'd, I'd love carving. If, if I had the opportunity to carve everything every day, I would. But. Well, it shows, my friend. <laughs> I do enjoy it. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to go crazy. Sometimes too. Yeah, it depends. I do a lot. Uh, upright, but yeah, uh, when I was doing all this work, I sat because there's again, it's just a lot of this little picking. I didn't need a lot of control, but it was also up a little higher. I feel crunched over a bit. But when I'm actually doing these kinds of shapes, I definitely want to stand. I do a lot of standing when I'm moving around, but this kind of work, I would sit. I know some people do it, but I went and visited the Thomas Mosier workshop, mm -hmm. and a couple of the cabinet makers that have hydraulic. Uh, back benches mm -hmm. with uh, uh, granite slab tops <laughs> for assembly purposes. Yeah. You know, that's pretty flat. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't want to have to lift that. Yeah, but. yeah, and again, it's like the carving for me is not always uh, furniture. Like right now, I'm carving some balusters, so that's got a different height. But all right, so now I'm starting to set in around the leaves of the flower a little bit, just to opening up that area there. And again, we're not trying to copy anything exactly, so we'll just use what we have for the sake of time here. And again, I mean, it's okay to change the shapes, right? If you, if you only have a gouge that that's curvy, and that's the shape, and that's too broad of a curve you want to make, you can take it and you can drive the shapes. You can push different curves. You can slide it around and do different things. You can, you know, whatever, whatever needs to get done for that particular thing. So I set in and I just kind of relieve around it first, just take the kind of the rough cut around it first. doing uh, furniture carving a furniture scale we'll say you know type of carving um, use the seven sweeps a lot for like a cantus leaf tips and 
flowers and little little things. And those are like if you're doing if you're doing uh, period work, uh, especially there's a lot of volutes and stuff like that in there. The seven series works really nice for the uh, volutes and shapes and things like that because it gives you a nice spiral. So the sevens I have. I think I probably have a smaller one, but the ones I use, I have a 7, 4, 7, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. <laughs> and I think I have a big one too for, for roughing out, but, um, but you use those tools a lot for this stuff. And it's interesting, the tools change uh, depending on the scale of your work. If you're doing bigger stuff, you need, well, you don't need it, but it's nicer to have bigger tools, right, so you're not nibbling. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want things to look like they're whittled or picked at, right? I want to try to have a good, good flow and kind of rhyme or reason to it. But, you know, I try to do some architectural carving and things like that, so sometimes the tools get a little bit bigger, sometimes there's relationships if it's small, but, um, and again, some of the some of the other sculptural stuff I want to do is going to be a little bit bigger and might require some other tools too. Did the period furnitures of their time have these exact size sweeps, or did we kind of just copy it because we saw what was necessary to make what they did? I, I don't know when the when the numbering system became. Uh, into, vogue. Uh, into vogue, like the English pattern system, the London pattern system. Because um, I do have some older tools, like, uh, uh, like the Adder's Tool Company is not, you know, super old, they're not period old, but they're, you know, um, I think they started in 1890, they're, they're already using the London pattern system. It, it, you know, there's got to be some other relationship to the time period, but I don't, I don't know if, if, the, if the period tools all had Uh, that common theme, or whether you would go get gouges made at the blacksmith, and the, they would have ones that are, you know, a little curvier, a little flatter, that kind of stuff. I, I don't know that. That's a good question. But, but the numbering system from different countries can be different. Most of them work off the London pattern. The Swiss is slightly different. I do have a couple of older um, Italian tools that have a totally different numbering system. Mm -hmm. So. I used to used to be more concerned about the numbers as I was learning. Now it's just, you know, I need something a little curvier, a little flatter, and that kind of stuff. I mean, I have to know the numbers more for the workshops than I do for the carving. Okay, let's do this one. Maybe that fit. Let me do just a little bit more of this flower so we can work on that flower afterwards too. I'm gonna to stop in a minute and give you a chance to take a look at everything. Where's that pattern to help me see it? Usually when I carve too, I definitely have a, a, a kind of a, a pattern to how I lay out my tools, right? And again, it's like I'm not just picking and choosing. I usually have all of my stuff laid out, pointing, and, and I know my fishtails or whatever, my V-tools over here, I'll have some kind of a system to be able to pick these up and not be looking at them all the time. And again, even, even though I have a lot of Swiss tools, the ones I use a lot, I do change the handles. Like, that's a Swiss tool. I took all of the, all, all of, all the coating off of it, and it's a different color. It shapes it a little bit, but I, but I know this is my five fishtail just by looking at the handle. Right? And, uh, this is a Swiss tool. I just changed the handle. I, I like the longer handle for how I use it, but I know that's my 11.7. Right? I have different ways that I do these different things and change it up, and, and like that's the little uh, vayner from them. So I just look at that handle. That's my 11.1 vayner. So do a lot of that type of stuff. And then the older tools, all of them have different handles anyways, for the most part. I don't have any matched sets or anything. Huh? How do you sharpen at 11-1? <laughs> Wet dry sandpaper. Huh? Wet dry sandpaper. It's the only way I can get in there was, was a piece of 400 and 600 grit wet dry. 
The smallest one I have, and I, the only reason I got it is I did a, a carving for the Museum of Fine Arts. I, I had to reproduce a, a carving, and the little vein lines on it were smaller than my 11-1. And Swiss makes a, a 0.5 millimeter veiner, so I have a little 0.5 millimeter. And then the one millimeter is pretty good, but the one millimeter, the <laughs> the curve that it gives you, the shape that it is, is is pretty indicative of the shape at the bottom of your VTOL. Take your VTOL, yeah. put it in there. Your 11-1, it's pretty darn close to that. So if you want to clean up an inside corner and not pick up the big VTOL, this is nice to get in here and clean up all that stuff too without having a really big tool in the way for that stuff. So, so again, this, this is the fussy part here, this kind of stuff. It's just... Getting in here. Since you've used some of the older tools like like a Dees, yep. you find that there are times when a carbon tool steel tool, because you can get that extraordinarily sharp edge, is better than a high speed steel tool just for a couple of cuts. So uh, all the carving tools, I don't think any of the carving tools I have have high speed steel like a turning tool does. Um, but yeah, the older tools that man, they hold an edge really well. Um, the Swiss made tools, I don't know if this is fact or not, but I feel like they're softer, which makes them easier to sharpen, but they go dull quicker. Yes, sure. uh, then like the Dastra, Dastra is another nice yep. brand of tool that I use a lot. Um, So getting in these little tiny places, this is a tool I use a lot for this kind of internal small work. This is a two millimeter number two. <laughs> it's a two-two. I also have tasks, tacks, lights that I use. So I actually turn off the fluorescence because it's too I I don't get any, I get either too much shadow or not enough that I can see what's going on. So I have these little independent task lights that have a daylight setting to it that I like a lot. I can see much better. Here, I'm just kind of making up the shapes with the tool that I got here. What happens there? It gets that long one. So at this point, all of this work is done. This is glued to the leg. Right, because I want this to go into that leg shape. It needs to be able to blend into this back curve. So this is when this whole thing's a unit. So this is coming off of the leg, blending those things together. This is, this is a five, actually. It's a little scoopier because I'm being a little bit more aggressive. It's actually nice being back in mahogany. It's just the last project I did was in Hickory. In hickory. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a little different. It wasn't carving. It was just... <laughs> but even hand plane is stringy. I never really made anything out of hickory other than... Axe handles. Yes. Sawdust. <laughs> chips. But, Very sharp chips. But it's one of those things. It's a it's a more contemporary designer, and that lighter wood. They they like the grain of it. Has varying colors. It's a kind of that substitute for ash now. Hmm. All right. Sometimes when I have a lot of things coming together like this, rather than setting it in all those corners, I'll take the V tool, go into those intersection points, and just rough them out first down. It separates out the fibers a little easier. It relieves it enough that you can usually push right through. Have you ever tried using a back bevel on the V-tool? Back bevel on the V-tool. Oh, an inside bevel like yep. that? Um, I, I do it a little bit. Not as strong, but I definitely have an inside <clears throat> bevel a, a little bit. I think it makes it a little easier to sharpen too. <sighs> 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 
me just do this and then I'll stop and pass it around for a sec. Let's see. Off my game now with your, uh, your carvers, <laughs> giving the inside bevel. How do we know about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll practice first, I guess. <laughs> I don't want to spoof anyone's tools. This is what I want right here. I charge double, Mike. Yeah, same prices, yeah. Double, double my, my usual fee. Idea what's going on. I'm gonna just maybe draw a little bit on that flower. Like, what do we want to do? So I think about like this flower. If you you know, uh, I wanted this to look like it was shooting out from underneath the leg. You could aim it any way you want. You can kind of aim. You could have it face up or down a little bit more. So just think about you know where do you want it to be? How big or small? Like if you want this leaf to drop way down, that petal to drop way down there, you can get more tip to it. Uh, it could be more open or closed. I think about it, if you want it more closed, I might might uh, bring that forward and kind of tighten it up a little bit like that, give the tip and have a base so it kind of closes up a little bit more that way. But most, it's easier to do it if it's open. right? Here. So I just kind of uh, give myself a sketch and think about how do you want these things to come around. Yeah, I'm just going to have kind of a, a base to it. All right. Start doing a little bit of carving here at the base of this thing. Okay. Now, let's see. Let's start with something like this. Just going to start to separate out maybe where that central portion is going to be. Like with all carving, you've got to give it some amount of shape and profile to let it let it have some movement. So as I start separating this out, all right, everything's everything's pretty flat, right? So it still has this curve to it, which helps, but I didn't want to give it some shape that way. So. So as I do this, then I'm saying, okay, what do, where do I want it to do? What am I thinking about? I'm thinking about uh, bringing these, these petals down. So before I carve any petals, just think about elevation. Where do you want this to do? Right uh, here I got a lot of height because of the grounding. So you might as well take advantage of that to, to, uh, to give you some elevation differences. Same thing, I'm gonna kind of scoop through here. All right, let's think about something like this. Giving it a little bit of a round. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to think about some height changes here. This one's going to overlap that one. I'm going to tip it. I'm going to bring it up and bring this one down a little bit. Do you have a dominant pedal? Do you let that one be a dominant pedal? Maybe we do that. You could have them overlap and radiate around. This is a bigger pedal to me, so it looks a little bit bigger. It gives me the opportunity to make that a dominant pedal. Kind of. Let's do. Uh, yeah, let's try that. And down here, I think about. Okay. 
tighter curve, but I'm just, just driving the tool rather than using the shape, just giving it a little bit more curve rather than picking up another tool. Do you usually have this many tool shapes out of the table? Uh, no, because I have a lot, because I was doing a lot of different things. I would have I just been on the tools. I probably would have had eight or ten okay. tools maybe at this point. Maybe. But no, I would have been a lot more organized. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fairly organized woodworker. I, I put a lot of things away when I'm not using it and yeah. try, to, try to minimize what's... Well, I, I've what's found out. more chisels you have laying out on the bench. The yeah. longer it takes you to find the one you're looking Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't have as many out, and I definitely have a system to where they are. So when I put them down, they're always back in the same place. Okay. Try to be very systematic about that if I can. And again, what's fun about this is just, you know, let it go wherever you, whenever you see it, just let it be. And so I'm doing a lot of this, we're just holding the same tool. There's no reason to be switching out too much here. So I haven't given anything really any real shape yet. Let me stop and just see kind of where we are. Really just thinking about what's overlapping, where's elevation, do you want to start getting like that larger pedal that's just up in the air right now? I have an opportunity to bring that up and to actually kick it back down to the base, right? Make it look like it kicks back down and you know, different things. Right, I think what we're gonna do, I wanna tip this one down. So I'm just taking a little off the back side first so I can see how much I want to tip and how much I want to... So for strength purposes with this, um, you're not going to do any really any back cutting so it stands out away from the... I, I am going to do some. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I do, that's the last thing I want to do is that, 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 that undercutting at the end of this thing. I said, I'm just trying to get this pedal, maybe it look like it comes up and over and down here. Again, you don't want to over exaggerate the curves too much either because then it makes it weak, right? So just give it enough curve so it's got the reflection of light that you want. Then also depending, you know, obviously it's not a realistic flower, it's very, very stylized. So, um, uh, some vander lines, some highlight lines, just to give it some other movement can be helpful. I'm going to take this edge down a little bit too, over here. So I curved it down, now I'm tipping it more that way. Just to give it a little bit better direction. Make it look like it's aiming out that way. This one, I'm going to bring it down a little further. I'm going to go this way. It's funny in that show. It was all you know. It was all furniture makers that did the show. I was the only. Um, I was. I was one of the only ones that did uh, a non-furniture form, which was kind of fun. It gave me an opportunity to, to play around a little bit. All right. That one's 
better. I think I'm just gonna aim that one out that way. Maybe tip off the back. I think these ones I'll even tip down a little bit that way. All right, just to give it a little bit more of an open look. Probably give myself a little bit more depth there. And again, when you're doing stuff like this, you have you know, it's going in a certain place. What's, what is it? Is it high? Is it viewed high? Is it viewed low? Where do you put the detail? Do you put the detail up above? Like, you know, you want to think about the viewing angle and, and what it is. And I wanted it to be bold enough, but I also wanted it to be interesting if somebody actually went out and looked at it as an independent, you know, uh, thing or element. I wanted it to be visually interesting, but not, I mean, I mean, it couldn't be overly complex either because Again, a certain amount of time into each one of these things. Let's see, I'm gonna do this one down here. Tim, when you're carving, do you present what you're doing under different light so that you get a sense of how it might look? Yeah, because you do a lot of it down like this. Every so often I just put it up. Sometimes I'll actually put it down at the level it needs to be just so I can see it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Good point. Tip this one down here. Okay, let's maybe do a little bit on the inside of this guy. Six. Too many tools on the bench. I also want to make this look like it rolls around. It's, it's kind of flat and stagnant. I need to make it round and I want to make it look like that. It's open in the middle, not just flat. So I start setting in what I think might work here. And eventually I go to the outside and I kind of scoop down with it. So I come off that square cut. This is uh, this is not an easy thing to do with an audience. <laughs> well, they're, they're getting out. Hmm. Well, okay, good. Yeah. yeah, show them when I'm talking about it. And show it when it's done. No, no in between. <laughs> further up. Also, the other thing is I don't want this to just be one mass in the middle. I want to make it look like there's different layers. layers yeah. That overlap. So again, I can think about how do I want to do that. I can make it, let's do one. I can hit that and maybe overlap it here. And then it might be nice to have one in here a little bit.
I always think of this part like a like a Bob Ross painting. It's like, no, don't put a don't put a tree there. Don't put it. Oh, that's nice. A <laughs> bee. Yeah. You got to work on your hairstyle. Yeah. 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 Grow the beard back. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll chip in and get your permit. Okay, good. That'd be nice. Now I'm going to come in a little steeper at the end here, give it a little bit more shadow. Give this a little shape. I'm just going to do a little bit more and we'll pass it around and see if anybody has any questions. And again, I can give each one of these petals a little bit more shape, but let's just take that little veiner. So maybe give it a little something. So I notice with these little tools, it's easier for me to kind of choke up on them and kind of pinch rather than trying to hold up these these little tools with both hands. I can kind of pinch and push at the same time. Let's do this one like this. And I try to. What's nice about like these little vein cuts is you can give them direction so they can help your eye kind of read these different shapes. And the other thing that can be helpful is a little stainless steel brush. You don't want to sand these things, but the brush can get the little nubs out of it and it gives it a little bit of a sanding. It's kind of flowerish. <laughs> Looks kind of like a flower. This is one of the projects we do in one of the workshops, but like on these leaves here, it's a, it's a V-tool cut on either side of that. And just giving it a little shape breaks it up, gives it that stem to stand up pretty quick, but a pretty easy cut. Just a V-tool cut, V-tool cut, gouge on either side to do that, and, and veiners that come off of that thing. So just think about, you know, what are you trying to do? Like these upper leaves, same thing. It's just a, just a little veiner cut on either side, a little scoop on either side. Gives it some height. One. All right, let me do a little undercut here. Just to get... Yeah. Yeah, they make the tool thick enough so it doesn't just break, you right. know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can see why the, the small vein is better than trying to use your V-tool. Oh, this is a file. Yeah, yeah, you have a lot more control, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Not with file. It's, made by it's file. easier to get in there. Mm -hmm. All right, so undercutting, I mean, if you look at, you know, carvings, you start looking at different, different carvings, the more severe undercutting happens when you're with the grain because it's stronger. So you can get a lot more robust on this one than you can on something that's cross grain. The cross grain one cuts nicely though, because you can get in here and just peel at it. But you want to think about, and I also considered, it wasn't just about what it looked like. I didn't want this to be a huge, it's going to be a dust collector anyways, mm -hmm. you know, for the, for the client. But I didn't want it to be like you can't get in there and dust it out. <laughs> It'd be so severe. But. but you're already paid by the time you... Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's hopefully, true. Hopefully the check's clear. Oh, yeah. Yep. People who have furniture like this have no. professional cleaners. Cleaners, yeah. Right. <laughs> Point there. Right. Yeah. They don't do their own dusting. Yeah, I mean, you get so much material below there. That's a little extreme. So what does a piece like this run? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
60? No. I'll make one for you for 50. <laughs> <laughs> Does that include shipping? <laughs> no, I usually say it's, you know, more than a Chevy, less than a Cadillac. It would be a used one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyways, this pedal's too big. There's, there's things I don't like about this just because we were just winging through it, but that's what took the time is looking at it, making the, ma making the adjustments you want to make and, and all that stuff. So there's definitely things I don't like about the shape, but. Yeah, that, um, it was interesting on those sunflowers, that, that, that was one that I kind of played around with the undercutting and what, what could I get away with, what couldn't I get away with. I just kind of experimented with that and, you know, well, the basswood's pretty forgiving, but some of it I didn't like <laughs> at all, but can't help myself. Here, just going to give it a little something. All right, so just undercut that the top edge a little bit just to give it a little shadow. But anyways, any any questions on any of this stuff? It's this, this is a lot, just kind of a a lot about the build. I want I really wanted to share how how this got developed. But that to me is like that we don't talk a lot about how you develop patterns for pieces and things that you're doing. That's all I got. Unless you have questions, you're more than welcome to ask some questions or whatever. Like I said, if you want to sign up for the blog, just write your email on there. Uh, my wife, Andrea, if you haven't met Andrea, Andrea will. <laughs> She's the one that makes all of that stuff run. It's not me. She's the boss.